this morning, <coughs> we're going to have a look at the material for the study of shape. Now, by, when I talk about shapes, I, I mean regular shapes, because of course irregular shapes would be endless. When we give the children any of the shapes, again, it's only a help, really, if we give them the full classification. You see, when we had the colors, we gave them a pair of each of the colors, and then they would have, uh, they would know that the, when they met the various shades, they would know which color it was, but they would know all the colors. And so now when we give them shape, we must give them all the shape, all the regular shapes that there are, not just one or two. Now to some people it's strange that we do give them all these shapes because usually uh, we start the study of geometry at a much later stage and it's felt to be rather a difficult subject. But the children are surrounded by shapes in the environment and I think really today they, they have all the shapes. You see, you have hexagonal tiles on the floor. So you have tables of different shapes, you see. But we all of us grew up with all these shapes being used in our homes or pattern or in some way in which we saw them. But because our attention wasn't drawn to them, we remained very unaware of them, you see. And then when, at a later age, when we came to study geometry, it was very difficult for us because we began with very strange definitions and a, a lot of names that we didn't know. And we were unaware of the shapes, although they had, we had been surrounded by them. Now it is the plane shapes that I'm going to show you today. And I'll show you all of them, the whole material, and then I'll explain how it's used. <laughs> we first have this tray because when we first introduce them to the shapes, we are going, as always, to begin with the most contrasting. And I think the most contrasting are probably the equilateral triangle. Now, that has three sides. So a, you cannot enclose a space with fewer than three sides. And then the circle, which has the greatest number of sides. Remember, you learned that a circle is composed of a great many straight lines. And then that always seemed nonsense when you just heard it as a definition. But between four, five, five and a half, the children can construct a circle with straight lines. It's one of the things we do with them in handwork. And the square four equal sides, four right angles. The equilateral triangle, of course, that has equal sides, and if, it ha if you have a triangle has equal sides, it also has to have equal angles. So that would be the first piece we would use. <laughs> now we have a cabinet of five drawers. The first drawer has a gradation of six circles. The largest is 10 centimeters in diameter, the next nine centimeters in diameter, eight centimeters, seven, six, the smallest five centimeters in diameter. So it's a regular gradation one centimeter on the diameter between any two in succession. Now we have a draw of quadrilaterals. 
quadrilateral meaning four-sided and this is a draw of rectangles and the, the first one, the first rectangle is 10 by 10 centimeters and the angles are right angles the rectangle opposite sides are equal and the angles are right angles so this one is a you can call it a rectangle, its special name is a square and this one is 10 by 9 this one 10 by 8 10 by 7 10 by 6 10 by 5 so again it's a regular gradation and the smallest one which is 10 by 5 it would be exactly half the square which is 10 by 10 Now we come to a draw of six triangles. Perhaps it would be a help if I wrote these words on the board. We classify triangles by their sides and their angles. They each have three sides. There they can vary in three ways. They each have three angles. So there they could vary in three <coughs> ways. Now an angle can be a right angle and then that is 90 degrees, isn't it? It can be smaller than the right angle, in which case if it's less than 90 degrees we call it an acute angle, right? And if it's greater than 90 degrees we call it an obtuse angle. Acute just means sharp, obtuse just means uh, uh, wide or we say a person's obtuse if they're very thick, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first one we saw was the equilateral triangle. That was in the tray. triangle. Now we have three triangles with two sides equal. Remember what that is called? Isosceles. Yes, isosceles. those are isosceles. So we have three triangles with two sides equal. So those we have three isosceles triangles. Now if a triangle is an isosceles triangle, then two of its angles are equal. And every triangle has two acute angles, and you name it by the third angle. In this one, these two sides are equal, so those two angles are equal. This is the third angle, and it's a right angle. So this is a right-angled isosceles triangle. In this one, those are the two equal sides, the two acute angles. This angle is an obtuse angle. So this one is an obtuse angled isosceles triangle. This one, the other two equal sides, the two equal angles, that's the extra angle, it's acute, so that is an acute angle isosceles triangle.
So we've had three sides equal, we've had two sides equal, and the only other possibility is to have no sides equal. So these three, no sides are equal, and they're called scalene triangles. And again, they each have two acute angles, so we name by the third angle. This is a right angle, so it's a right angled uh, Right angle scaling triangle. This one has an obtuse angle, so it's an obtuse angled scaling triangle. What will the other one be? Yes, here we are, an acute angle scaling triangle. So you, you can there are just seven different triangles. So that's the full classification. Those are all the possibilities that are. And immediately your mind feels sort of clear, doesn't it? Yes. Draw will contain some polygons. And we have six polygons. Of course, you can go on having more and more sides to a polygon until you reach a circle, can't you? So it's enough to have six. We have a, a pentagon, five sides, hexagon, six. I'm to write and I think, but I mean, some of you are looking at me. I <laughs> know pentagon, I mean. Hexagon. Hex pentagon is uh, five. Hex is six. Seven sides, heptagon. Eight octagon, nine sides nonagon, and ten decagon. The um, polygons are made to inscribe in the largest circle. If I was to take the circle out, any of these would just exactly fit in. There's a certain relationship built into the cabinet between the figures. Two curved 
and for figures and for quadrilaterals. have the ellipse and the oval. Now, we have had the square, the rectangle, the square four sides equal and the angles are right angles, the rectangles opposite sides equal and parallel and the angles are right angles. Now, there are four other possibilities, and only four more. You can have opposite sides equal and parallel. See, and that is a parallelogram. <coughs> you can have all four sides equal, but the angles are not right angles. And that's a rhombus. You want them written up? <laughs> Parallelogram, opposite sides equal and parallel. The angles can be right angles, don't have to be. A rhombus, the sides are equal, four sides equal, the angles are not right angles. Now, here, uh, the rest of the world has, has a, a different name for these two, and you have over here changed the names, I think. In most parts, and not in all parts of America, in most parts of America. It's your individualism coming out. Now, this figure has only one pair of parallel. See, these sides are parallel, and the others are not. We call that a, a rhombus, and I think you call it a trapezoid, don't you? And then the only other possibility is no sides parallel. See? And that's what we call a trapezoid and you call a trapezium. You really have turned those words around because this one, you get many tables, little tables that shape, don't you? And the word uh, trapezium means little table. <coughs> you never get a table that shape. So it's time you change back again to fit in with the rest of us. is kept in your stock cupboard until some children arrive at the point of being ready for it. But the first piece you would bring in would be what we call the presentation tray. The tray with the square, the circle with diameter of 10 centimeters and the equilateral triangle. I, I want you to notice the coloring. See, I've said to you already that the material has to show up whatever it is you're studying. Here we're studying shape. So we don't want it to, to be strongly colored. If the, these are of strong color, the ch uh, children only notice the color, they don't notice the shape. So this sort of uh, pale gray, slightly blue tint to it is a, a very attractive color, but it is not a dominant color. 
and the rest of the cabinet just means to be this light varnished wood. If we lift out one of the figures, the bottom of the tray is painted the same, color, same pearly grey as the figure itself. This is very important because the, the uh, firms that make the Montessori equipment, nobody watches them or tells them what to do, and they are beginning to make everything very much too colourful. See, this is a, they make the figures dark and they have a very thick yellow varnish. Her first, uh, in the beginning, she thought, like everyone else, that children had to be attracted by little rewards, sweets are sweet if they did the right thing, or uh, strong colours to attract them. And her very first cabinet, which must be in about 1907, I don't know if she used it with the defective children or not, but with the normal children. Uh, she made it with scarlet figures and the wood was painted white. And unfortunately, the uh, Italian firm makes the cabinet with scarlet figures and painted white. I saw it, I, I saw one last year, and it's simply terrible. It just hits your eyes, it's a color that hits your eyes, and you simply don't see the shape. So, uh, if you possess one of those, you could take the paint off and start again. Now, with this, you see we have the three figures and we have three blank squares of wood. And the first presentation would be just to put it in front of the child. And each, each uh, figure has a knob to hold it by. You lift it out by the knob uh, I'm taking the square out and you put it on the blank just above and then you pause for a few minutes because the bottom of the tray is in the same color as the figure you immediately get a pair of you see uh, this square here and this square here And then you do the same with the next figure. Here's the circle. I take that out and I put it on the blank square. And then I get two circles of the same size. And I pause to let the child notice that. Then I do the same with the triangle. It is important uh, to put the figures in the same position. If I put the triangle uh, skew wise but then now it doesn't look like that you see you must put it in the same position now the child is going to use his hands as well as his sight in studying these shapes so after he's looked at it for a minute or two then you take one of the shapes and with the first two fingers of your dominant hand, you feel very exactly all around the shape. And then you feel very exactly round the hole that it came from. Keeping the sensitive ball of your fingers on the edges you, you, uh, you can't turn your fingers and feel with your nails because your nails, I sometimes see people doing the last bit with their nails, but your nails are completely insensitive, you see. So you must keep the... It takes a little practice. doing, you're immediately aware of the difference. I mean, such very sharp angles here. Difficult to get my big fingers into the corners. And then the 
the child would have it to use. And he would need to use it for quite a long period of time. And if at first he was not very successful, he was a little clumsy in feeling, then you could sit down and give him another lesson in this exact feeling. It, uh, as well as being the study of shapes, so that he does become very aware of these shapes in the environment, it is wonderful for a training for the hands, the coordination of the hands. And you see, in fact, he is feeling all these curved, straight lines that he's going to find in writing letters, isn't he, for one thing. But he does get this very perfect hand coordination. And when you do it, really, uh, concentrating on it, you will find that you begin to know a lot about the figures by touch. Take the, for example, the um, polygons and try feeling around the edges, and you would find at once what, what a lot you could learn through touch. Become aware of the size of the angles, the length of the sides, so When the child has worked with this tray for a long time and really knows the figures well, then you could teach him the names. So, using the lesson I gave you last week, that three-period lesson, you would teach square, circle, equilateral, triangle. And you will find that the children adore these strange words like equilateral, triangle. <laughs> At this, point, at this age. Now you could, uh, depends on your class. If you have a big class and some of the children are just beginning to use this frame, then you would be wise, I think, to have a second frame in the classroom. If you only have a few children, then uh, you wouldn't need that. But we now proceed, this frame opens, and the teacher, in the evening when she's getting her class ready for the next day, would vary the figures in the tray, always using contrasting ones from the cabinet. Because the children need to get experience with all the figures from the cabinet but in a contra always as contrasting shapes. So the cabinet is kept in the stock cupboard, and there are many variations you could choose. I might put in one of the rectangles. Again, very contrasting figures. And when the children came to school, those of them who knew circle, square, equilateral, triangle would find three new figures for them to, to use. And you wouldn't really have to give another lesson because they, they would use it in exactly the same way. There'd probably be a little conversation about it because they're always interested when they find something different. And again, when they knew these well, been using them for some time, again you could teach the name, ellipse, polygon, rectangle. Now this polygon has a special name, it's an octagon. So 
So gradually, you would introduce all the figures from the cabinet, all the contrasting ones uh, in the frame. Children must work with this material over at least a couple of years. There's a great deal to learn from it. And then when they're older, five, six, seven, and come on to do some geometry again, they will be using this for their cabinet. children, of course, you will find them, you might say, doodling with the material. No. And they do really, in doing this, they do very intelligent things. A very common thing is to see a child just standing there, twisting the circle round and round. You see, but it's very, that's very important. The circle will fit in in any position, won't it? You will see them taking the square out and turning that round. And the square will, fi it will fit. You, you turn it at an angle of 90 degrees, and it will fit anywhere, won't it? And it the size are equal. Equilateral triangle, so it can be turned three ways. You'll do this with the different figures. The rectangle has to be turned. It has to turn at 180 degrees, doesn't it? You have to rotate it. And in doing this, he begins to learn some really uh, interesting geometrical facts about the figures. see children doing that, you leave them alone, you're very pleased. Now when he's had the variations of figures in the frame, then uh, in which he's really doing pairing, he's creating pairs and matching pairs, then we go on to gradations. We will bring the whole cabinet in and now you can no longer vary the figures from the cabinet because the some of the children will be using the uh, frames. And here we have the gradation of circles. And here you show him to take each circle out and put it on the table at the side. It's much better to put it on the side. Don't put them in front of the frame because the child gives the frame a pull and they all go on the floor. You don't want tables that are too small in your classroom. And then he picks up any circle, heels round it, and tries to find the correct place for it by feeling around <laughs> the uh, sort of socket or whatever you like to call it. And then he replaces when he's decided where it goes. Then he takes another if he was round. So 
not sure where it goes. He feels around the space and then he returns it. And if he makes a mistake, and again, it wouldn't really matter because there will always be one that won't fit in. So it is self-correcting. With a circle, there'll be one that won't fit in. Uh, but with many of them, like the triangles, polygons, they won't go in the wrong space. I think the circles are the easiest things as well to start with that draw. <clears throat> and once you have demonstrated how to use one of the drawers, then the child can take any draw he likes and use it in that way. he will probably have difficulty with the triangles. You see him find feeling around several shapes. practice, he really gets to know them well, can recognize the identities. <coughs> and then when the point comes, when he does it really easily, he's had a lot of practice with it, then you teach many names. These are triangles. This is an obtuse angled isosceles triangle. This is a right angled isosceles triangle. This is an acute angled isosceles triangle. So just take the three you are going to teach. They just adore words at this age. This one is the obtuse angle of the isosceles triangle. <coughs> this is the acute angle of the isosceles, the right angle of the isosceles triangle. You repeat each one many times. Can you show me? The acute angled isosceles triangle. And the right angled isosceles triangle. So if they make too many mistakes, you go back to the first stage. If they do that well, then you go to the last stage. Can you tell me which this one is? He has to say the right angled isosceles triangle. And when you begin teaching these words, you realize that the children of this age learn words much more easily than they do at a later stage, more easily than we would. And they learn them with enjoyment. So very soon, you're all of you using the right words. And then the child is able to once he knows them, he notices things in the environment. That is what is so exciting. He begins to notice that the table is a rectangle, or that the squares, that the, which the floor is made uh, with squares being put together. So maybe you have a bit of jewelry made of triangles. So he'll tell you which ones. But he becomes very, very observant. 
could have one of those uh, sort of games with them. Lots of little games we play when we just uh, got a few minutes to spare when we're waiting for the parents. You know, you sit in a circle and you can look around the room and you can say, I'm looking at something which is a circle. And you all tell me what I was looking at. Go on, let's play it. No, it wasn't that. The clock. The clock, yes. You choose pretty easy things at first. You see, then that's your turn. But they get very cunning, they seem to find things after a bit, you know. And it, it helps to make them really absurd. They love those good games. Especially if they can say, I'm looking at an octagon, or I'm looking at a right <laughs> angle isosceles triangle. <laughs> When they're older, I'll show you. These are. <coughs> we could take the large circle out. And because the uh, polygons inscribe in the circle, then you can put the pentagon in and you see it leaves very wide spaces, doesn't it? You could try the hexagon. The spaces are noticeably smaller, aren't they? The octagon. Oh, they're getting ready. Leaving very little room down the edge. The non again. Decagon. So look at the di difference between the decagon and the pentagon. So the child begins to see that the more sides a figure has, the nearer it gets to the area of a circle. And then if we got him to, we can stitch with needle and thread, showing that with straight lines you can create a perfect circle. Between four and five, we would start stitching curves with them as part of the handwork. I do quite a bit of what you might call geometrical handwork. One more thing. <coughs> Our right angled isosceles triangle has two sides of 10 centimeters. So, and the square has sides of 10 centimeters. The smallest rectangle is 10 by 5, so that is just half the size of the square, isn't it? We can show that the right angled isosceles triangle is 
is just half the size of the square, two of them equal the square. And then we could show that this smallest rectangle is just half the size of the square. So therefore, that triangle, this triangle, and this rectangle, which looks so very different, must be equal in area. So we go on using the cabinet for quite a long time with the children. when you got your children, if you've had a, a Montessori preschool. But if you don't get your children until five, but well then you see this, uh, you might go on and use it for longer because they're having to begin from the very beginning. you start from three years old or are you going to go? Yes, uh, around three, uh, with, the, with those first three in the tray. Because they're surrounded by space, as shaped just as much as they're surrounded by color. And then the sooner your attention is drawn to the factors of the environment, the better. You see, the more intelligent you become, the more aware you become. Can you introduce the uh, names of Tooth and the Q? Do you, you uh, tell them why it's a cute or why it's a No, you are better not explaining things. The explanation for a small child would be more difficult than the word. I explain it to you because you, know, you already know so much. <laughs> yes, but it is very difficult for them to take explanations. They like just a statement of the word. And they're just learning the, the size or the shape by sight. Well, they have learned it by touch, too. They have had it for some time. They've been uh, learning it by touch and by sight. And touch is a very big factor to the, in learning with the small children. When will they learn the definition? Oh, well, then the definitions are quite... Uh, you will find that age um, from birth up to about six, they just love names. They're very busy just learning language. And then... Between six and seven, they go into a totally different stage of development, having learned a very rich language. The more words they have learned, the more words they will add hereafter because the mind has gotten accustomed to using them in learning words. And you can then take this love of language into the cultural side of language and keep the love of language and the uh, pleasure in using words alive for life, you know? But at about that age, children begin uh, to want to know the reasons for everything. You see, they've built up enough knowledge with which to reason, or they should have done. And it's then that they like the rules on everything. And they begin to ask you why. And that is the age really for questioning. And the little ones say, uh, two and a half year old says, why to you? It's usually because he wants to keep the conversation going. You know, he's not particularly interested in the answer. But he wants to be talked to and he wants to listen. But for the uh, six and a half, seven, they want a reason. And you must give it very simply, in as few words as possible. And we are very tempted always to, oh, they've asked a question, I'll tell them everything there is, you know, and then they don't listen. It's too much. Just give them the a simple, straight answer. I, I always remember with uh, the first class I taught you, uh, 
there was one teacher who really believed in answering all their questions. <coughs> and two little girls were in the cloak room. One uh, wanted to know something. And the other one said, well, go and ask Miss Goldsbury. Oh, I won't ask her. She talks too much. <laughs> and I knew just how she felt, you know. <laughs> so you answer what it is you're asked for, not much else. All right, then. Oh, we just have a short break and then we'll go on something else. <laughs> 